while the unified army was sent to win a propaganda victory, another kind of army was going directly towards the true front line. The massive ambulant nemesis had a venerable army of scouts, observers and scientists, at all moments, trying to understand how it functioned. A team of expeditionary biologists had observed the creature for over nine days at this point, and it had already noted a pattern in its behavior. The man consumed much energy. Its organism needed a time of respite every 16 hours. The creature's liquid waste was made mostly of water, even if it had ammonia and other toxic substances that were never seen being present in a living organism. How the creature kept itself alive was a mystery to the field biologist, still had to unveil. But it was true that its biology less and less resembled anything that this world had seen before. Its body was like a fortress. It was believed that this creature evolved in such a way to be impossible to be swarmed by smaller creatures. Its body heat was strong enough to be lethal in prolonged exposures. Its skin was able to produce a toxic mix of water, salt and ammonia, not being hot enough to boil a mandari alive, but also toxic enough to cripple an adult. As any fortress, the skin of the beast was a home of vast armies. Those same parasites that infested now the host nation guarded their host with envy, capable of attacking any other parasite that dared to take their place. And it was the job of those half-dozen souls to bring that fortress down. And day by day, they had been pressured by the Secretary General to find results, to end what an entire army couldn't, to do the impossible. Once again, the Secretary General demanded new intelligence, his constant pressure let the team rush out theories as solid fact. But even the most outlandish extrapolations were becoming too little to appease the Secretary General. But in addition to the usual pressure, it sent something more than demands across a radio, a probe. A drone capable of crawling across the skin of the beast and capable of surveying the enemy as near as possible. The team eagerly accepted it and planned an usage of the drone in the same day. The heavy drone would be dropped on top of the creature as it was near its resting cycle where it would not be noticed. Probably the most important event in the story of the Mandari was unfolding that night with only 12 of their race observing the drone. The surface of its skin presented an alien landscape. This close, the skin resembled a patchwork of interconnected tissues that explained the large flexibility of the beast's skin. Keratin-made towers of hair rose across the strange surface and layers of dead skin lose themselves at the waking of the probe. The drone moved across the place, avoiding the parasites, and ate the dead skin of the man. Temperature was relatively low at 35.2 degrees centigrade. When put into a position of interest, the drone started to use a sonar, trying to map the internal structure of the creature, while making its way across the skin of the creature. An hour would pass, the drone forged a path across both sweating skin and parasite alike. New intel about the anatomical structure of the creature, still to be revised by the team upon retrieval. It took two hours to the drone to claw its way towards the face of the man. Their objective close, and this close, they remembered how hot the body of the creature would be. The drone shuts, its feet goes dark. The only thing still functioning was the tracking device, the only signal of life it could give. They sat in silence across the makeshift field command of the operation, gazing at each other in the hope the silence would be broken. They mourned for the loss of the chance they had and the loss of the data, the data. The data still is there. Someone pointed, breaking the silence. We can still salvage it. All quickly understood what that implied. Sure the drone was too heavy for any of them to carry back. However, the hard drive indeed was as portable as any wallet. Their arguments took invaluable time before they make the decision. They had to retrieve the data, whatever the cost. The only ones ready to retrieve the data were the research crew. A team of people compassing of 12 Mandari and only 4 hazardous suits. 
the four chosen would be protected by the toxic ambient of the skin of the creature. However, the main problem would still be the temperature. According to their models, the creature still would have three to two hours of rest before the creature's temperature could rise. They had to act. Instead of the careful insertion by airdrop, further from the middle of the creature, they had to drop closer to the man's mouth. Those Mandari were not paratroopers, and the suit gave little help in the descent. But it was in the creature's endless turbulence to spread the team across the landing zone. It was a nightmare. Those that were left in mission control had to hear the cries for help, the screaming and running aimless away from the parasites. One was taken by the parasites, torn apart limb by limb, and eaten by the inhabitants of the creature's skin. Other landed into a pool of a mix of salted water and ammonia, drowning after half hour of tense suffocation, inside their own suit. Another died by the exposure of the heat, with only one of the team reaching the drone. Only for the creature to awaken. The second company had reached the ERI's headquarters with its cargo, the secret motive of the invasion of the host nation. Riches. Gold reserves, silver ingots, hard cash, jewelry, works of art, and anything they could loot from the corpse of the city. A war crime the general secretary would try to hide, as much as possible. This money was used in a simple thing, to gather the largest army that Mandari ever saw in its history. He bribed, bought, and strong-armed his way, to produce as many jet crafts and armored vehicles he could. This would be his triumph. 780,000 tanks, 270,000 aircraft, millions of soldiers, trillions of ordnance munitions and missiles. A true unified army of all member states, bought and maintained by the deep pockets of the looted treasure. The chief commander, even frustrated with the usage of his soldiers on ground zero, just to make a propaganda victory. Became even more non-linear with the idea that he was the cover force to the looting army of the secretary general. Nevertheless, he was the only officer that was shown to be competent enough to command the multi-language army of the ERI to any degree of usefulness. And thus, he was the one sent to organize and formulate a plan to strike at the creature. A victory that would forgive any sin both the ERI already had done against the host nation. Armed with the intelligence the team of biologists and ordered by the secretary general, the chef command would strike at dawn against the man. 4 a.m. The unified army was stationed on the last resting site of the massive ambulant nemesis, divided into three massive corps. The nemesis is resting closer to a major river, and it was theorized that the nemesis would still be asleep for more five hours. 5 a.m. The first corps, compassed by the armored assault, was sent to initiate the initial bombardment of the creature. 5.27 a.m. First corps engaged, a hundred of hits across the creature's skin. The massive ambulant nemesis awaken and start to rise, its full high. 5.29 a.m. Bombardment no longer effective, the thick skin of the foot of the creature no longer suffered the damage. 5.32 a.m. The massive ambulant nemesis took notice of the first corps, fist casualties reported. 5.35 a.m. First corps scattered, retreating towards a elevated terrain. Massive ambulant nemesis went in pursuit. 5.47 a.m. Second corps opened fire from the highlands, surrounding the massive ambulant nemesis. First corps re-engage, the enemy is disorientated. The bombardment showed signs of damage. 6.30 a.m., the Air Corps is sent in mass. Over 70,000 jet crafts are sent. They attack the weak spots of the massive ambulant nemesis. Casualties grows, but morale is high. 7 a.m., the creature retreated, going back closer to the water. A general attack is ordered. The entire jet craft of the army is sent. The creature was bleeding. 7.17 a.m., the man reacted, stepping over the ground army, blowing the aircraft out of the air. 9 a.m., a lucky hit strike the eye of the man, moral grows, 25% of the army is destroyed. 10 a.m., 
the Air Corps ammo ran out, the jets retreat back to the base. The creature sees the opportunity, attacking both the First and Second Corps, the armies are decimated. 10.55 a.m. The creature was fully alert. It used the water as a weapon, spitting the water in the passing jets as they return. It managed to destroy tens of thousands of jets that hit the ground, either trying to evade the deadly water or falling by the weight of the sticking water. Tens of thousands of aircraft are lost in the first attack. 11.12 a.m. The first corps broken, the second corps is ordered to retreat, the chef command ordered the third to relive the embattled armies. The order was countermanded by the secretary general, who ordered the third corps to retreat. 11.30, end of the engagement. 370.500, armored vehicles. KIA. 108.150, armored vehicles. MIA. 78.070 self-propelled artillery vehicles. KIA. 97.000 jet crafts. KIA. 103.700 hovercrafts. KIA. 35.780.000 line soldiers. KIA. 2.700.000 special forces soldiers. KIA. 5.000.000 Lion Soldiers. MIA. 658.000 Special Forces Soldiers. MIA. At the headquarters of the ERI, chaos ensued. Representatives of the 12 nations, many who are now in the pockets of the Secretary General, demanded an explanation. Their countries now petitioned to remove him from the charge of Secretary General and many others demanded him to be put in trial for crimes against their kind. However, he had a deadline. In 10 more days, the whole biome of the ERI's territory would collapse due to the weight that the man put on the ecosystem. He still had a plan B. What remained of the unified army now was sent to the wilderness to burn every forest, to harvest every crop, and kill every cattle. Everything was to be collected or burned, the supplies were gathered, and the food was to be rationed. With what remained of the member nations at his command, and the riches of an entire local power to his person, he became the most powerful personality in the ERI. And with his de facto authority, he would dig his people within the cities, ready to challenge the man, in a game of hunger. During the first month, riots and chaos ensued. Many civil leaders caused problems and accused the Secretary General of outreaching his authority. Those whose silence could be bought would find themselves promoted away from their charge, or simply silenced in any form he could. The soldiers of the ERI patrol the streets. Citizens had to take their rations of food from the officials of the ERI instead of their nation states. Martial law was implemented in over 20 nations. However, there was one nation, a nation that would not be bought or silenced, that still offered opposition to his project. The nation of Aparsha. Author's name and the link to original text is in the description. Consider tapping the thumbs up and pressing the subscribe button if you enjoyed this video 